I have bad news, and it's not new news. An American service member was just killed in Afghanistan. A Taliban suicide blast in Kabul. Uh, the name is expected to be identified a little bit later. The deadly attack happened to the U.S. as the U.S. works to finalize a peace deal with the Taliban in their ninth round now. But with this being the second deadly attack in just this week, is peace possible? Is it on track? Here to react to the peace deal as we know is retired U.S. Army helicopter pilot, Republican candidate for Michigan uh, Senate seat, John James. John, thank you very much for coming. Fox News contributor, retired U.S. Marine Corps uh, bomb technician is Joey Jones. Is back. We all know uh, Joey Jones and retired U.S. Army infantry captain and author of a brand new book. You're looking at it right there. It's excellent. It's called All Out War. Sean Parnell is here and the former commander of Navy SEAL Team 3, the most highly decorated special operations unit in the Iraq War, retired Navy SEAL Jocko Wilnick. Guys, thanks so much. A round of applause for that. <laughs> from today, uh, their world changed and uh, the country's world changed as the, <clears throat> as the towers were burning in New York. At least a dozen of these uh, men went into those buildings and they changed your life forever now. What does it feel like to get that type of respect for what you guys did? It's very humbling and to know that they were hold, back here holding the line while we went overseas and held the line you know, in foreign countries, but they were back here trying to protect this country. It means everything to hear from them and right back at you all for what you have done and continue to do to take care of us back on the home front. That's I, why you joined, right? Uh, yeah, look, I watched you on September 11th as a sophomore. I, have no, I don't have any military in my family, but I watched first responders on 9-11 in this great city run into the flames that day to save people that they didn't even know in an act of selflessness that I had never experienced before in my life up until that point. And it was because of each and every one of you that I got in the fight and took the fight to the enemy in Afghanistan. So thank you for that inspiration. <laughs> He writes about it in the first book, Not Left With Him. Joe, Joe, have you seen your sacrifice? Well, uh, you know, I may have maybe half a dozen experiences that I really consider to be combat, getting shot at or blown up or something like that. But it was the little things like seeing, you know, a, a child that had been dipped in scalding hot water that needed medical attention that stick out to me every single day. You know, I think what people realize or don't realize, I mean, is that our firemen and police see that every day in this country. Every single day they see innocent civilians or people in peril, and they run to it and they save them. Um, and so, you know, they may not have the combat experience we have, but they certainly have the experience of trauma. And, uh, and I know that we probably don't do quite enough to recognize that and to make sure they're living healthy lives, especially when they're... Uh, you know, retiring. And so for that, I'm always humbled when I see you all in uniform. You serve, you went in business, now you're going to go back to serve. What are your reflections? Well, my biggest thing is I, everybody remembers where they were on September 11th. Uh, we just sent our first class of, uh, of a college freshmen to college that may not have been born on September 11th. And I was up at West Point a couple miles uh, up the river and I remember where we were when the towers came down, and many of you and, and your compatriots went up those towers. I was a part of the class. The first class took our oath of affirmation, know we were going to war, and just know that each of you inspired us to do what we needed to do abroad to protect this country because you are here protecting our homes and our families here. And so I just want to say thank you. And they get that, and they, and they thank you back. Now, let's talk about what's happening. 18 years later, uh, there's a, an, after nine rounds of talks, the Taliban and Ambassador Khalilzad have a, uh, they say, a peace deal. Your reaction, Jocko? Doesn't seem like there's much peace there right now. We just lost another service member. As far as I'm concerned, if you lose another service member, negotiations just ended. And the attacks haven't stopped, Sean. Well, how can you have, how can you negotiate peace when there's no peace? I mean, and, and so it, I feel like one of the biggest red flags of this deal is that it does not incorporate the Pakistani Taliban, who just four days ago attacked a major city, two car bombs in Kabul, U.S. service member killed today. You cannot negotiate peace in good faith without a comprehensive ceasefire right. first. The president says, I haven't signed anything yet. I don't think the secretary of state's on board yet. The sitting government of Afghanistan has been uh, X'd out of this so far. Well, and that's, that's the big concern here is that the, the government in Afghanistan really has no say in this. Not only that, but 
What we're looking at here is we're really negotiating that the Taliban no longer harbor who might want to hurt us. It has nothing to do with what the Taliban may do in Afghanistan. And so the big thing right now is the Taliban is negotiating on paper territories they can continue to control. And then as soon as we're gone, the old uh, adage, which is absolutely true, we may have the watch, but they have the time. And so we're not the first uh, country that they've waited out. We're not the first ally. Uh, John, the word is in between sessions, they celebrate another victory that they defeated another superpower. We know that's not true, but what do you say to that? Well, we have to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to end these never-ending wars. Talking about nation buildings, we have a nation to build right here back at home in Detroit, in Baltimore, but they're still blowing our brothers and sisters up 18 years later. We have to end these wars, but we have to hold them accountable. The president um, needs to understand and get the briefings what's actually going on on the ground, the humanitarian crisis is going on, on the ground, because our national security can never be divorced from, human, uh, from humanitarian well, uh, issues and, and rights. You have to end political wars. You have to end wars right. that the ebb and flow every four years depending on who wants to be in power and how they want to get it in this country. If they want to win an election, you say bring our troops home. Tulsi Gabbard is going to do it till the cows come home. But what does that actually mean? Because there's also a strategic war. There's also something to be accomplished. And we've lost sight of even what the mission might be for years during this war. Today, what is that mission? Today, that mission is what does it take in that country or out of it to keep our country right. safe? Correct. And that should be the talking point. That's not where the attack came from. Home. It was plotted we and troops. planned. We're happy I, to be there if it keeps our country safe. We didn't bring them home from Germany or Japan right away. You know, and so, you know, look at the long game. Look at what Korea. Does it to keep us safe? Well, look, look, I think nobody wants out of Afghanistan more than I do or Absolutely. anybody on this couch. Absolutely. But it's critically important that we do it the right way. Right. Afghanistan is a, is a perfect example of a country where you can do more in that country with less U.S. troops. And, yes. and that requires a shift immediately from a counterinsurgency mission, which is what when the president refers to we are there policing the country, that's what he's referring to. We need to move back to surgical strikes, counterterror, go after high-value targets. And when you do that, right. it keeps the enemy on their toes and allows the Afghan government the space and time that they need to secure and govern their own people. I want to talk about something else, but lastly, Jack, I just want you to weigh in. If the president is watching right now. What, what, can, what concerns would you have? I think you have to look at this from a strategic perspective, like everyone here is saying, and then you've got to make decisions that are going to be hard, that are not going to be popular, and you have to stick with what you believe is best for the country. That's what you have to do, and it's hard to do. Right. Uh, lastly, uh, the MLS is the latest politically correct organization <laughs> who decides that uh, the Betsy Ross flag, our first flag with 13 stars and 13 stripes, uh, should be banned from a Utah uh, game because they say it's it, it has a political tint to it. What do you think about the first American flag having a political, uh, being politically unacceptable? I think it's amazing that we live in a country where your biggest concern is being at a beautiful <laughs> soccer game and what you really have to be concerned about. They is were tossed someone... out. They were tossed out. Yeah. Of the game. This, is, this is why people in this country need to read and understand and learn history. That flag is the greatest symbol of freedom that the world has ever known. It represents throwing off the chains of oppression. And so we fought a war to fight against a tyrannical government. And then less than 100 years later, we gave 300,000 lives in the righteous cause that ended slavery in this country in the Civil War. No country has done more to fight for the individual as the smallest minority. And that flag right. is representative of that. And it, uh, John, they, it's used by a white supremacist group. Look, racism is still a problem in this country, full stop. But you're not going to fight racism by kicking folks out by flying a Betsy Ross flag. I guess and dog on to you, if somebody in that stadium was burning an American flag, they'd be allowed to stay. The First Amendment is something that everybody in this room and everybody on this stage are willing to put their lives on the line to protect and preserve. Right. And we need to make sure that we are both fighting racism and preserving our rights to live our lives as free Americans. Very well said. And Joe, you were asked when the Ka uh, Colin Kaepernick took a knee to address some football locker rooms. So this is another issue coming up, different sport, same issue. Yeah, the thing about Colin is people forget this. Colin didn't kneel first he said, and before he said anything else, he spoke about our flag representing today the oppression of groups of people. He, he equated our flag today and the freedoms it stands for to the very worst aspects and the worst, darkest corners of our country. I never will buy that. Listen, when the Betsy Ross flag was the flag, veterans didn't have the VA. If you lost your legs in war, you weren't going to get taken care of. You're going to go back home and hopefully have family to take care of you. There was no such thing as some sort of 
uh, you know, check that the government wrote back to you to take care of you. A lot of things have gotten better in this country because there was a Betsy Ross flag, a Revolutionary War fault that led to a civil war, that led to freedom right, uh, uh, to civil rights movements, and make this country better every day. If you want utopia, live a la live right. a long and happy life, die and go to heaven. Not only is this country great, but it made the world a better place uh, because we are great. Uh, Jocko Willenick, Sean Parnell. John Jones, uh, uh, Joey Jones, and John James, thanks so much, guys, for coming down. Thanks for your service. A round of applause.